Thank you. It's a perfect hey, start. In New York. Yeah. Hello, Hi. New York. Hello, Sir James and Lady Jeannie. It's so good to see both of you. It's so wonderful to see you. I'm so sorry that we're not in person, but thank I you know. for being up early to you know, I was thinking it's been a long time since we last saw you in New York. It was, it's been a couple of years now since you were here. We miss you dearly. Um, I know it's, it's all out of our control. Um, but I just wanted to, I guess, follow up because I distinctly remember the last time we spoke, you had expressed ideas of maybe, you know, slowing down a little over the last year or taking it easy. And it seems like that has not happened. You guys are busier than ever. So how has the last year uh, been for you? Um, it's It's been a, a year of change, hasn't it? Yes. But I think even with the, uh, the sudden change in our lives, particularly, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we were going through photos last night on our, on my phone, because I was looking for <laughs> a phone of a picture of, of my husband and Wib the last time the four of us yeah. were together. And we'll talk about him a bit later a very close relationship um and i kept looking and i could not believe how much we traveled it was i said oh look at this here we are in japan oh we're in new york already that was only a week later oh look at this now we're in ireland we're in london why didn't we go to london why did we go over to turkey and then we went to london we our feet never touched wow. the ground did they that's but, amazing but all we see on these photos are smiles and flute players and music and lots of social evenings like we've had with the flute center in new york yeah so, um uh you know i think that when that's ingrained in you when you're sitting in one place you kind of just uh keep creating yeah and i let's talk a little bit about william bennett um the flute community recently lost him and uh it's a, a terrible loss can you both share how you're feeling after hearing that news and the fond memories that you have of him. Well, sad, really. I very mean, sad, very sad, yeah. I mean, you know, Webb was a very big influence on me when I was a kid. I, I arrived in London at 16 years old, and he was already 19. And he'd already been studying, I think, three years with Jeffrey Gilbert. And uh, immediately he sort of took over and showed me how to play the flute. Took you under his wing. Oh, yes, he did. Yeah. And I think you recalled the first time when, when we went to meet him, you just talked about how he was your idol. Yeah. He was your idol. And then when, when we finally got together, and of course he's larger than life, um, and, and when we, we were sitting one time having dinner, that was the photo I was looking for, and actually I recorded the two of them because they were talking about their memories. And one of the things he said to me was, it was, I pushed Jimmy to go to Jeffrey Gilbert. Wow. You know, we all, and that's one of the things that we had talked about that we're going to discuss later is mentorship and how these people have such strong influences. And I believe that's true, isn't it? Yes. But I mean, in fact, um, you know, I was quite happy learning with John Francis, who was a Bach freak. And when I came to play my first recital in Carnegie Hall. I played all seven Bach sonatas. And the first one I started with B minor, and I remembered John Francis' lesson. And then I finished with the E minor, and I remembered John again. <laughs> and that's special. For some of the students who might not know Sir James's history at that time, he was 16 and he was awarded a grant, I believe, from the British government to go study in London for how many years? Three. three years and so it was a very pivotal point in your life and you went to the Royal College of Music I yes believe. where I studied with John Francis right and then uh, I, I left the college and went a year to the Guildhall to study with Jeffrey Gilbert yeah and just in the way that um, that Wib was a huge idol to you and a mentor you are a mentor to I would say you know any Flutists nowadays, um, you know, all these generations that have kind of come after you. So um, what have you noticed in the shift in young people, the way they approach their careers these days? It's, um, I would imagine, much different than it was years ago, especially after the pandemic and everything. Well, 
I don't think things have changed much in the way of learning the flute. You know Can you I mean? talk a little bit more about that and why why you think in terms of learning the, the flute, things have been consistent? Well, I mean, when I was learning to play the flute uh, with Wib, the, the whole thing was based on scales. Yeah. And uh, I thought, uh, once I get to London, I won't have to practice scales anymore. Yeah. <laughs> John Francis got me stuck my nose in Marcel Moy's yeah. daily exercises. So I did those for three years. Then I went to Jeffrey Gilbert and I thought, right, no more scales. Wrong. That's funny. Even more difficult scales. Yeah. And then I went to the Paris Conservatoire and I thought, no more scales. Wrong. There was a whole day dedicated just to playing scales and yep. etudes and another day to interpretation where we learn box and artisans, stuff like that. Right, so there's no way around scales. It's the tried and true method. Yes, I mean, but people don't try it enough. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what you're trying to encourage. They, don't, they yeah. don't try it enough to find the truth about the matter. I think that when we were learning, well, I learned after Sir James, of course, there were, of course, many less distractions. And also, um, you had this understanding that you were with one teacher. You would stay with that teacher. You would you would branch out, but I, I don't think the quick fix was as as prominent in our lives. Mm. We didn't have the pressure of the social media. Yeah, and this is so destructive for someone I believe like a classical musician who it takes years and years and years to mature and to really get to know your instrument to to really find out who who your mentors should be. And it's, um, it's very, very tricky, very tricky. And um, we're always trying to encourage the students, you know, study with the people, go to the places where you can really listen to music all the time, right? Yes. Go to the cities, go to the places that have an orchestra, study with the people that, you know, have the experience. Okay, not everyone can go to New York City. And we're not saying that because that doesn't mean you're going to get a job just because you go right. to New York City. Right. But it's just, the, I think it's just, it's really the thinking behind. And that's what we're trying to encourage the students to do is that it's, and how many students I've gotten messages from when they graduate school is my life is over. I'm not never going to get a job or after the second or third audition, I give up that discouragement. And this is what we try to do because I've learned that from Sir James, you know, there's, there's just this way forward. You are a musician, just keep playing music, keep going for it. But also you should keep studying when you're out of school, right? That's right. Yeah. You should always be learning, right? That's the way to, to grow yes. and to keep expanding your horizons. No, even if you have not got a concert or anything on the horizon, practice. Yeah. I mean, uh, today I listened to the radio and they played my uh, uh, version of the Katachurian. I remember that. I, I, I was absolutely amazed. I couldn't believe anybody could play that. <laughs> 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 I mean, I'm... Um, and if it hadn't been for having a real foot hold on scales and arpeggios, you couldn't play a Cachaturian like that. Right. But also during this time, it wasn't the idea that I, I've done a concert, let's go out and celebrate. I remember many times I would hear Sir James play something like the Cachaturian in the first half of the concert. I'd listen to the second half and I'd come in the dressing room and he was practicing. He was always, um, always practicing for yeah. the recital that maybe is going to happen in two months or for or fixing little bits, but mostly uh, different repertoire. So so the plan within one, the discipline that you learn when you're in school, you take that with you when you finish school and, and you, you work that out for yourself. You know, this plan for practicing, the plan for the day, the plan for how you're going to to be able to afford to take that audition yep. and, and, and this, you know, it's a plan for the long haul. And I feel like that's kind of what you're getting at here too, is that yes. it takes a long time, a lot of commitment uh, and don't give up 
but if you really want it, you got to stick in, stick in there for, uh, through everything and, and for the long haul. It's tough. And, but it's also a lot of fun. Yeah. Because those friendships true. that you make during school, you can, you can, can create so much and there's so, so, so much sponsorship and, and, and so many opportunities for young musicians to be playing because everyone wants to help a young musician. You see it all the time. And with the internet today, that's the one good thing about it. You know, look it up, look it up for the foundations, walk down the street and see where there are concerts. And you call up two friends that you went to school with to play the oboe and the bassoon say, hey, and then you say, I've got a group. And, right. <laughs> and, and just, and that enthusiasm that you have, you know, to keep it going, because if you stop right away, when you leave school or university, it's very hard to get it back five, seven, 10 years later. And at the age of 35, when someone, uh, we say to someone, what would you like to do? They say, well, I've just finished getting my doctorate and I want to be a soloist. And I sit there and go. For all the hours and time that you spend doing a doctorate, there's another guy on the other side of the wall practicing. And he doesn't get his doctorate, but he wins the audition. But if you're very disciplined, and I understand the importance these days that in the, especially the American system, that you, in order to even get a foothold in, in a university or a place to have a job, which will give you that stability that you need later in life and that you can still play. If you have that discipline, you can manage doing your You can do it all. Yeah. And, and doing that. But it is yeah. that discipline, I think, that, that we talk about of having young and that you have. And that I mean, you this is a perfect segue into, I mean, you're talking about sponsorship of young people and bringing young people along in their careers and giving them an outlet. I mean, this to me is what the Galway Flute Academy is. And you guys are in your 33rd year now. Wow. That's an achievement right there. Um, Here we are. Yeah. <laughs> Bring it close. Um, 33rd year. Yeah. Creating this summer festival, but, um, it's been much longer because it actually started in the 80s. That's before a lot of you were born, excuse me. We are old. <laughs> I know, the flute plan keeps us looking young. Yeah. <laughs> so, but in the 80s, right, what started as a simple master class with this particular, what we're doing together, started back in the 80s, but you were teaching way back when you were in Berlin and uh, many of those students Oh. come to our festival actually and teach. Yeah. Um, but you started, I believe it was just a simple master class and everyone came in Switzerland. How do you feel like the festival has developed over the years? What are you looking forward to the most this year? Um, seeing the students again, yeah. seeing our students again. Seeing, um, how, seeing what progress has been made. Yes. Yeah. And what we found the first year of the pandemic, because we went online, and as everyone knows, unfortunately, we, we are, well, not unfortunately, we are staying online. Yeah. Because we still don't believe that we could, ha we could run a festival that would have about 150 to 200 people in one room and no one would get ill. And if our students can't stay healthy, um, we can't do it. We don't want a super spreader event. And it has been a tremendous disappointment. So I do want to put that forward to the students. It was a very hard decision, which is why we didn't come out late. Uh, we came out later advertising. We kept waiting to see how it would be. And also we have to protect Sir James, but it's really for everyone. Um, but what we were so impressed with, with our students was the first year of the pandemic was the strength, the strength within each of them we saw such resilience within the students and it was so impressive and also the level of playing and then the last year we saw that 90 percent of our applicants were new and this and a very very high level and we thought this is what right. we want to do we want to be able to reach across the miles not just for people who can afford a holiday in switzerland to come and to, right. to really take in uh, five seven eight days of what this great man can share with them and his colleagues, all these friends that play in orchestras. And, and when we call them, they, they say, of course, I'll come, of course. And um, so we, we have a very holistic attitude to it, uh, not in the way that holistic with yoga, it's holistic of being very positive, non-competitive, and just um, do the best you can. Yeah. And, and come together and keep growing, growing, growing. No one is judging you, just 
uh, and learn. Just listen and learn. And uh, can you talk about some of the artists that you decide to invite and uh, those partnerships? Sure. So James. Well, one of my well, there's a lot of my favorite. A lot of your favorite. We had yeah. to narrow it down this year. It was really difficult. We had so many. We, we could invite about 50 artists. Yeah. A lot of them being his students. Kirsten sure. Oh, for example. This guy, Phil, what's up, PZ Phil? Cassandra's Dream. Cassandra's Dream. I mean, if you want to hear modern music on the flute, this is the guy who does it. It sounds fantastic. And he follows it up with something like Paganini. Agony <laughs> variations, but his arrangement, a modern arrangement of it. And then perhaps he will play the uh, Martinu Sonata, something like that. And one thing that really blew me away was Kirsten and uh, um, Gareth. They played one of those CPE Bach. WF Bach. Uh, WF Bach. Even more difficult. Flute duets. The one on the F minor, I think, mm -hmm. uh, and it was fantastic. I mean, and these guys just got together the day before. Wow. They never met each other. Kirsten is the solo flutist uh, in the Concert Cabal, along with Emily Bynan, who also yep. came last year. And uh, Kirsten is, is a wonderful teacher. And what what we do is we we farm out our students. So they come to us and whether it's online or whether it's it's in real life, we continue this relationship well when we say that we've created this academy this is a, an, a, a place of relationships that we can help our students move to the next level so a couple of our students right now are studying with kirsten mccall in amsterdam and um, they've been doing this for years and one of them right now that has been studying with us since she was 11. Luna. wow uh, Luna, and she became a rising star and recipient of a 16 karat gold Nagahara headpiece. We have a lot of support for our festival. And uh, Luna is going, has been playing second flute to Emily Bynan and to um, Kirsten McCall. And she'll be in tour to be, uh, on tour this summer with them. That's impressive. With the, with the orchestra. With the orchestra. Yeah, yeah. With, with the orchestra. And this is, is so we take the time with the students during the festival we always have this time for this called your next step and then also personally with us where they say what do you think i should do one girl now who's a rising star she says can i have a call she lives near us she's in lugano she's from turkey we've been able to sponsor her for many many years zeynep kenny uh, she wrote the other day she says can i come and meet you to talk about what you think would be best for for me next and this is what we we wish more students would do because um there's nothing like asking someone who who really has their finger on the pulse internationally also the guy said to one student there's an opening in vienna to go study with carl heinz schutz who's one of our artists who comes back every year principal flutist vienna philharmonic Learn in the academy. You might be playing in the Vienna Philharmonic. And you right. know what? You never if know. If they apply and they get in there, they will be playing in the Vienna Philharmonic. And then yeah. they'll be ready for that audition. And this goes for American students too, because you can get funding. And, and what we try to do is just to give them the vision that these opportunities are there. And also then us personally can open the doors. So Karen, like you're at. Yeah, it's like your flute matchmakers or something like matching the flutists <laughs> with their careers or with a or with a teacher with a mentor that can really take them to the next level. Yeah, and then we also have so Gareth Davies, a principal of the London Symphony, who right now is doing a recital with Michael McHale, right this moment actually, mm -hmm. and uh, who Sir James is our pianist um, from Northern Ireland, and now he's he's in London. His wife plays in the London Symphony. Uh, first time they got together, he says, oh, yeah, I know the repertoire I play with James Goy. So um, <laughs> they're doing something. And Gareth, Sir James is former principal flutist of the London Symphony. And Gareth will tell the story along with Kirsten McCall and with all of them that the first CD they heard or well, the first time they saw him was on TV. And it was because he said on TV, oh, the flute's real easy to play. Gareth thought. This is really sure. easy. Yeah. He met Sir James years later. He said, you told me it was easy. He says, well, I never told you that if he wanted to play it well, that you had to. 
<laughs> and so, so they'll be working on orchestral. And then we have Ulla Milman, who many people know, the solo flutist of the Danish Radio Orchestra and yeah. Danish or Concert Orchestra. And uh, Ulla is just great. She taught, uh, teaches Nielsen, and she wanted to do it on the Mozart Concerti this year. We love her style of teaching. She, in the pandemic, was working very hard with her students on the Tapeno Gobert, which is, of course, Sir James's uh, signature teaching um, mm -hmm. hour that he gives, and also along with Ulla and the Donjon. And then we also have um, Marinette Piccinini is coming back this year. Wonderful. Marina wasn't, we asked people each year and uh, she was available and also uh, she'll be working on the Paganini caprices or whatever they prefer, but because Paganini is her, her big thing yeah. and she does it so beautifully. Good friend of ours and the Flute Academy and Francesco Loy, who is the solo flutist of the uh, Don Carlo, San, San Carlo, San Carlo. Opera. Opera, I have it right here actually, in Genoa. <laughs> He'll be working on opera. And, and everybody can find all this information on your website as well, too. On our website, yes, here it is. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. In addition to all the enrollment uh, dates and instructions. Yeah, the 22nd to the 26th. Um, I just want to mention one thing. The reason why we choose these different artists is what they can offer the students. Francesco teaches opera. You know, you want to take an opera audition. Nicola Mazzante with Piccolo. Yep. And Gareth Davies with orchestral auditions. Um, and then we have also Bill McBurney on jazz. And this year we have Lowell Lieberman uh, is, is coming on on Saturday afternoon to work with a few students, whoever wants to play for him on his the pieces that he has written. That's and a special opportunity. Yeah. Very special. And I do want to say also that Lowell, when we offered him his fee, said, I would, I don't want a fee, I just want to do this. So wow. one of our scholarships that we're offering, our, one of our students is the Lowell Lieberman Scholarship. That's great. So all these artists give back in many ways. And we also have Nancy Stegnita from the Interlochen Arts Academy, who gives so much uh, to the American flute player that we had to bring her in. And uh, so it's a very exciting group, uh, very balanced group and um, and we do hope even though we know that people don't want to be online they want to be in person learning is learning right true I know you both are you know advocates for others and you want to help other people evolve so have you ever kind of turned that lens on yourselves what do you look forward to um, improving on in, in your future and what ways do the two of you want to evolve? Yeah, I would like to see how we can uh, build certain things together, but find a better balance with where we're at in our lives, meaning more a little more free time for each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, how how to how to really balance it all? I think there there's quite a bit of things we still want to do. There's a a lot of additions we talk about with. My husband even flute duos that we play we talk i'd like to play more duos with my husband and um as far as evolving i was thinking the other day i haven't even told my husband that i want to take on um a couple of my colleagues and to work on bringing the galway flute academy back live yeah. the galway flute festival live and also how we would structure that so this and to really work on getting funding so that this will really exemplify the legacy of Sir James because um, we can't have him working 24 seven at the festival anymore. And Gareth Davies is a big help in this. Uh, they have lots of ideas of how they want to do concerts and um, pay homage to this great man. So that's one project there. Uh, another thing that I can, I know I keep talking about the free time is the James Goway competition. We haven't been able to do that because we went online and we didn't right. want to have an online competition. So this is working and also being able to place our students more and in solo positions in through the, um, the, the people that we know, I'd like to get this more settled and then we can have more free time. <laughs> um, How about you, sir, James, what do you think? Oh, I want to go on holiday in Italy. Well, we that sounds lovely. Holiday in Italy. Yeah, a, long, a, long a longer time. time. <laughs> that sounds lovely. I don't blame you. Well, you know, I would like to work out 
more how to help people to better understand what they're doing when they practice. You know, it's not a question of just picking up the flute and rattling off a few scales. But you have to know how to how to do these scales and how to make them sound really brilliant, musical. And when you're when you're having musical, that doesn't mean to say you've got to play quick. Because slow is also a, a thing. You know, even the first half an L scale uh, exercise. You know, just to beautiful scale, yeah. To learn how to play scales like that because it will have a a direct effect on your music. For example, look at this. See how many scales there are, and in thirds, yep. and little bits of scales in thirds. And if you can play the whole thing, and you're really in shape, right? Then Mozart stands a fighting chance. <laughs> well, thank you both for your time and for being here today. Uh, while I do miss having you here in New York, it is lovely as ever just to see you um, in any circumstances. So. I really do appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedules to sit down with us. And can we just say uh, one thing before we go? Sir James has brought his flutes, and we do want to just uh, thank the Flute Center in New York for being with it, for us, you know, such a, a high end, high level um, exponent of, of having wonderful instruments every level, and the fact that we bring our instruments to have them repaired, and that the flute that Sir James has in his hand right now is his Cooper flute that uh, is a very, very special instrument, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this one is A442. And I have another gold flute, which I, which Cooper made for me to play in the Berlin Philharmonic. And that's wow. A445. And which ones do you uh, like to, to practice on the most, Sir James? What do you find yourself picking up first? Oh, it depends. <laughs> it depends. <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I like to play my platinum flute. I play that the most actually. And um, the, the one that he made for the Berlin Philharmonic, I think is one of the best flutes in the world. The Cooper flute. It's yeah. a really tremendous flute. It and sounds several beautiful. Of my colleagues ordered it to make CDs. Oh yeah? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, and the, and the, I believe that William Bennett introduced you to Albert Cooper. He did. So it's another, another great tie to him. Yeah. So we hope we can cre help create that circle. And one thing I didn't mention when you talked about what we would, li would like to, to uh, be doing with our goals is uh, cooking. I've been the cook for a while, but guess who? Wow. Is cooking. He makes a great omelet, everyone. But his <laughs> latest thing he, he's going to make is uh, chocolate. chocolate mousse. Great. Yeah. I promise if you come to the live festival next year, but if you come this year, we'll talk to you about chocolate mousse. But so it's all these wonderful yeah. things that you it, through through playing music, it gives you such an enthusiasm for life and and for cooking and and playing flute duets with your best friend and yeah. talking to Katie and oh, so great. thank you, thank you guys so much.